Hello my dears, welcome back to another video. So today I want to talk about a video that I saw. It was uploaded by the channel for a YouTube channel and it's called Heartbreaking Moment When Kids Learn About White Privilege, The School That Tried to End Racism. Now I wanted to talk about this video because I think the topic itself is extremely important and that is about the indoctrination that is happening in our schools. Now this subject hits close to home for me. I remember when I first saw this video, I was really angry. I will share later on in the video why I feel so passionately about this topic and why this video really irked me. But for now, we'll just first react to it and then we'll just talk about it. This activity is intended to explore how society favours one race over others. People often confuse white privilege with being wealthy or being rich. And it isn't about that. What it's about is the absence of having to live with the consequences of racism. Now this statement only makes sense if you believe that white people cannot experience racism. Because the reality is white people do experience negative treatment and do experience negative things because of their race. All you have to do is go on social media and see the countless people who feel very comfortable to say very negative and hateful things about white people. Anti-white racism is socially acceptable on social media and people do it all the time without any repercussions. Virtual opinion, but if you have a token white and you're hanging out with your friend group of color, you need to ask permission from everybody in the group to bring your white friend. Like don't just bring them, ask for explicit permission from everyone because just because you're comfortable with them doesn't mean that everybody's comfortable with them. I might not be in the mood to deal with white shenanigans that day. That's that's all I'm saying. And another thing, it feeds into their ego. Like don't don't let them think they're a good white person. Don't don't give them that card to use against other people. Please don't do that. All you have to do is look at the companies who feel bold enough and comfortable enough to say outright that they don't want to hire white people. All you have to do is look at the people who've been outright just denied the opportunity for a job despite being fully qualified for it because they don't meet the diversity quota requirement. Matthew Furlong lost out on his dream to become a police officer after he wasn't hired over other candidates, but he recently won a court case in which he appealed that decision, arguing that as a white heterosexual male, he himself had been discriminated against. So, um, so Matthew, you're 25, live in Cheshire. Your dad had been the serving detective inspector at Cheshire Police. And for you, as a little boy, watching your dad in that role, this was the dream. This is what you wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I always saw my dad as a kind of role model. He sort of inspired me to want to join the police yeah. in the first place. And growing up with my dad and obviously his friends also in the police sort of gave me a really good insight into the sort of rewards and... The, uh, the difficulties that the police officers have to... And you'd, um, as a schoolboy, you'd gone and done work experience there and even at sort of A-levels, you'd volunteered sort of once a week working with the police force. So you were, at a very early age, on track. This is what you wanted to do. You, your dad had a bit of a look into this to see what had happened, see if he could get any feedback of why, potentially, that you hadn't gone through to the next bit. Um, and it, there was something in the, in the marking system. So when you normally go into an interview, the candidate is then marked. So what happens is if lots of people sort of pass or go through, they will take the cream of the crop and the ones with the higher marks will go through. However, in your situation, what happened was candidates were given a pass or a fail. So lots of people passed and went through. Yeah, yeah. So I think of 180 applicants, 127 passed the interview stage and there was only 85 positions available. So I guess it was how they then picked those 85 and that's where the problem lies. Yeah, so they implemented three selection principles. The first one being uh, anybody that passed who uh, identified as uh, female, black minority, ethnic, LGBT or disabled were automatically then uh, given a conditional offer. Mm. Um, the second principle was if anybody speaks British as their second language, English as their second language, um, they were offered a job. And then thirdly, anyone that already works for the organisation, whether that be PCSO or police staff, they were automatically mm. offered a job and those filled those 85 places. Well, it's very interesting because you'll hear people say things like, oh, you can't be racist to a white person, but you can be prejudiced towards them. Which I've always found very bizarre because the definition of racism is to be prejudiced towards someone because of their race. So by definition, if you are being prejudiced towards someone because they're white, you are being racist. So to summarize the rules of the game, the teachers read out a series of questions and you either take a step forward or take a step backward. So if you're asked to take a step forward, that represents that that's an advantage. Whereas if you're asked to take a step backwards, that's meant to represent that that's a disadvantage. If English is your parents' first 
best language, take a step forward. Oh yeah. English is also not my parents' first language. Now this is gonna blow your mind. Are you ready? It has not hindered them in any way, shape or form, and it's not hindered me and my siblings in any shape or form. Now I know what you're thinking. But how? How is this possible? Now I'm gonna let you in on their secret. Are you ready? Are you ready? Come close, come close. They know how to speak English. Now I think it's disappointing that this needs to be said, but quite clearly it needs to be said. The only reason why English not being your first language would cause you to have a disadvantage is if you don't know how to speak English or if you don't know how to speak English very well. There are plenty of people in Britain and in other parts of the world who don't have English as their first language, but speak fantastic English. It's almost as if these teachers have never been to Amsterdam. Just take a trip to Amsterdam and you will find people who speak phenomenal English and they don't even live here. I remember the first time I went to Amsterdam, there was a Dutch girl who came up to me and she asked me a question in Dutch and I apologized to her in English and just said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand. And this girl just literally goes, oh, you're English. That's fine. And then she just flipped to English like it was a sport. That would never, ever, ever happen in the UK. If you come to the UK not knowing how to speak English, I don't know what to tell you. You're screwed. The most you're gonna get is loud, slow English with some hand gestures. That's the best we can do. Because I used to work at an airport and I used to see that scene all the time. A tourist would come in, doesn't speak very good English and they're like asking for like directions to like the train station or something. And all you see is the airport staff going straight and you go round, round the corner. <laughs> And you know what, I think that's probably where this ignorant assumption that these teachers are making comes from. I think it comes from the fact that because they can only speak their first language, they assume that everybody else can also only speak their first language. But this is a phenomenon that only really exists in English speaking countries. In other parts of the world, People are bilingual, trilingual, they can speak multiple languages. Like my parents can speak three different languages and they can flip flop like it's nothing to them. So I do think these teachers must assume that those who don't have English as their first language must struggle to speak English or not know how to speak it. Because if they were aware of the fact that many people don't have English as their first language, but they still are able to speak it perfectly, they're still able to read it perfectly and they're still able to write it perfectly. And as a result, they don't struggle to understand and they don't struggle to be understood. So therefore there would be no difference between them and a native English speaker if they're both able to speak the language well. So for them to assume that if English is your parents' first language, you automatically have an advantage. That assumption can only be understood if they believe that those who don't have English as their first language must not know how to speak English very well or must not know how to speak it at all. Imagine trying to teach children about ignorance and racism whilst projecting a very ignorant and borderline racist assumption. If you have ever been the only person in the room of your race, Take a step backwards. Now I actually have a very different perspective on this. I think that you are at a significant disadvantage if you've never been the only one of your race in a room. And the reason why I say that is because of my own personal experiences and the things that I've also witnessed as well. So for me, I've been in situations multiple times where I've been the only one of my race in the room. My first exposure to it was when I was in primary school. I went to a very, very white primary school. And I remember I was the only black girl in my entire year. Because there were so few black kids in my school, I remember there was this little girl who joined in nursery and all of my classmates assumed she was my sister. I remember they came up to me and they were like, oh my God, Patience, we saw your sister, she's so cute. And I'm just confused because I'm thinking my sister does not go to this school. So I was like, uh, my sister doesn't go to this school. And they were like, yes, yeah, she does. We've seen her, she looks just like you. So I'm curious now, right? And I'm like, take me to this girl that you think is my sister because I need to know who they're talking about. So they take me to this little black girl, bless her heart. She looked terrified. Like she was just looking at us like, why are these big kids here? Like, who are you? They were like, see, there she is. That's your sister, right? And I was like, guys, um, I don't know this girl. That is absolutely not my sister. And they were just so confused because they were just like so 
sure. They were so positive. Oh man, that was funny. I found it funny back then. I still find it funny now. Some people might be like, oh, they're being racist and saying all black people look the same. Listen, we were like seven years old, okay? Relax. They were just connecting dots that unfortunately didn't connect. But outside of school, I've also had situations where I've been the only black person in the office. And I honestly do think that it's an advantage to have experienced these kind of scenarios. And the reason why I say that is because when you are someone who has never ever experienced being the only one who looks like you or is like you in a room, it can make you very, very uncomfortable when you're in that situation. What I've noticed is that because I've had more diverse experiences, it's made me a lot more comfortable with different types of people. You can put me in a room with all black people and I'm not gonna feel any type of way because it just feels like a family gathering. You can put me in a room with only white people and I'm not gonna feel any type of way because I've been in that situation before. I've been in diverse situations and it's made me adaptable. What I've noticed is that people who've never experienced being the only one of their race and it doesn't matter what race they are because I've also seen this happen with white people too where we've all been in the group and all of us are black and Asian or whatever like they are the only white person in the room and you can see that they are visibly uncomfortable but then I've also had situations where some of my friends when I went to uni I remember having a conversation with one of them and they were saying how they were the only black person in their in their um in their seminar and they then that made them feel quite uncomfortable so what I've noticed is that people who've never never been the only one of their race in a room are very uncomfortable with it because they're not used to it. They tend to be a lot more reclusive, they tend to be a lot more uncomfortable and it just kind of makes them a bit socially awkward. And as a result, they don't tend to enjoy the experience as much as everybody else because they're so like in their head about like how different they are to everybody else, etc., etc. So I actually think you are at a massive disadvantage if you've never experienced being the only one of your race in the room, because you are going to be a lot less adaptable than someone who has experienced that. Someone who has experienced that can be put in any scenario and they'll be fine because they're confident in all of them because they have experience being in all of them. Whereas if you've only been in one type of environment, you are far less adaptable because you can only really thrive in that one environment that you're used to. And I think it's kind of common sense which one is gonna have a much easier life navigating the world because the person who's used to being in multiple environments can really work anywhere, you know, because they, they're not gonna care about the demographic of the employees or who's working there because they're comfortable in all of these different scenarios. Whereas someone who is not comfortable with that is going to factor that into where they work and they're going to factor that into where they live and they're going to factor that into so many different things. Whereas the other person can go literally anywhere because they can be comfortable with pretty much anyone. If you've never been asked where you come from, take a step forward. Was Ngozi Falani behind this game? Hmm. I've already expressed my views on this before. I don't think it's offensive at all to ask someone where they come from or to ask someone where they're from. However, I do agree that it's a clumsily worded question. Instead of asking where are you from or where did you come from, I think it would be better to ask what's your ethnic heritage or what's your ethnic background? I think that should be the question that should be asked instead of where do you come from? Because I can understand why it can be quite a bizarre question to people who were born in England because you've got a lot of people who are second generation, third generation. So where do they come from? They came from a hospital in England. So I do think it's just better to ask what's your ethnic heritage? What's your ethnic background? ground because you're still going to get the answer that you want but you're less likely to offend because there are some people who kind of interpret that question as you implying they can't possibly have been born here because they're not white so just to avoid that I think it's just easier to just say what's your ethnic heritage or what's your ethnic background but as a whole I don't really think it's offensive for someone to take an interest in your ethnicity or to take an interest in your heritage I personally don't feel offended if someone asked me this question and the reason for that is very simple I'm proud of my heritage so if someone someone wants to ask me about it, I'm more than happy to tell you about it. I think if you're proud of your heritage and you're proud of your ethnic background, then it's not offensive when someone takes an interest in it. Like I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm not ethnically English. And I've said this before in a previous video, someone who's actually racist wouldn't even bother to ask you this question. They would just tell you to go back to where you come from. They don't care where that is, they just want you to go back there. I don't think this is something that disadvantages you in any way, shape or form. So I don't know why they're having to take a step backwards. How is someone asking you where you come from going to hinder you in your life in any way, shape or form? If you have never had to be worried about your family being stopped and searched, take a step forward. I don't get worried about if people ask me to stop and search. I must have white privilege because I never worry about my family 
being stopped and searched. Now, the reason why I don't worry about my family being stopped and searched is because my loved ones are not criminals. So even if they are stopped and searched, the police aren't going to find anything. So they'll be let go on their merry way. This idea that stop and searches are racist is very, very misguided. And it's just another one of those examples of people taking racial statistics, not really looking deeper into why they exist that way or what's going on there, just simply seeing a racial disparity and assuming that it automatically means racism and automatically means systemic racism. In the UK, young black men are significantly more likely to be victims of knife crime. They are also more likely to be the perpetrators. Because of this fact, police do tend to stop and search young black men in certain areas more than they do with other racial groups. If this is a racially motivated thing, then why do you rarely hear about elderly black people being stopped and searched? middle-aged black people being stopped and searched, black women being regularly stopped and searched. Young working class white boys are the second most likely group to be stopped and searched. Young white men are more likely to be stopped and searched than I am. And the reason for that is again, because they are the second most likely to be involved in that type of crime. So this idea that stop and searches are inherently racist stems from the fact that some people choose to have very lazy explanations for racial disparities. There are some people who don't believe that you should look at other explanations for why racial disparities disparities exist. Whenever they see a racial disparity, it always equals racism because they subscribe to the notion that systemic racism controls everything. So therefore they're not interested in exploring other reasons for why things happen. So naturally someone like that is not gonna be very interested in the reality that the reason why young black men are stopped and searched at higher rates than everybody else is because they are the most likely to be involved in that crime. They are the most likely to be the victims of that crime as well as the perpetrators of that crime. So when police officers are stopping young black men at higher rates than everybody else, it's not because they're racist, it's because of pattern recognition. And if you truly care about black people and black lives, then why is the conversation not on, why is it that young black men in the UK are the most likely to be victims of knife crime? Why is it that young black men are the most likely to be perpetrators of knife crime? Because really what you have here is a really big problem of young black men killing each other, which is also probably why no one talks about it because it doesn't fit the narrative. But the reality is the person who's the most likely to kill you is someone who looks just like you. The divide widens and the inequality of their position becomes clear. This is just like not fair now. Far away. Far away. None of us are white. None of us are white. It's unfair. Sorry. The last question. If your parents have ever warned you about racism, take a step backwards. <laughs> oh. If we were about to start a race, is this a fair starting no. point for us all? No! no. <laughs> Mackay, how do you feel standing there in the field of runners? I uh, kind of feel a bit alone. A bit alone. Uh, I, I can't really see it. I'm literally just by myself, more or less. I'm just a bit, a bit frustrated and annoyed that society nowadays really isn't fair. And I just wish everybody could be equal. Farah! It's kind of frustrating that like me and Sarah are just standing at the back here while the majority of people who may be white are like standing right at the front. That just frustrates me a bit because it's almost as in what society is today. I, w I don't want this to be how it is, but it is. So it just gets a bit frustrating. Henry, how are you feeling being right at the very front? Um, it feels quite weird because if you think about it, um, I think all of us should be at the same point. But sadly, the questions, um, the way that they were put didn't favour some people which I think is quite unfair. This video is ridiculous for a number of reasons. And the main reason is that it's not based on any facts. It's based purely on ideology. And that ideology is that systemic racism controls every facet of a minority person's life. And therefore they will struggle to succeed in this system that is designed against them. But the only problem with that is that if you actually open your eyes and you look around and you look at data and you just look even in your real life world, there are so many things that contradicts this ideology. For starters, you've got the South Asian girl feeling like crap because she's all the way at the back because of the questions it's led her to be all the way at the back. Now she's feeling really crappy and thinking that she's gonna struggle to succeed but South Asians are the most successful racial group in this country. Exhibit A, exhibit B, 
exhibit C. And just a little bit of research will quickly show you that Indians in particular, but Asians in general, are the highest earners in the UK and they also own the most property in the UK. But this just highlights the conflict between the ideology and reality. Because in this ideological game that she's just played, she's all the way at the back. So based on their ideology, she's the least likely to be successful. But then in reality, she's the most likely out of all of them to be successful because her demographic in this country is the most successful demographic. But this game is actually perfect at actually demonstrating why the systemic racism ideology just doesn't translate into reality. Another reason why it doesn't translate into reality is because you've got all of the white kids at the front, which most of them will be working class. And now they're assumed to be privileged and assumed to have an advantage because of their white skin. However, again, if you just have a look Look at actual data you will see that white working class children are the lowest performing group in the country every other every ethnic group performs better than whites bar black caribbean pupils is that correct yes that's uh correct andrew and um as i say this is why we simply can't um make this a bane versus white issue and actually beyond that you you, you get um, people saying, you know, black exclusions, for instance, black outcomes. You can't even do that because actually what we see is African children outperform, white kids outperform, you know, uh, the, the kind of average. And black Caribbean kids are one of the worst performing. So even once you start saying, well, there must be racism towards black kids because exclusions, you know, African kids are not, no more likely to be excluded from school than their white British counterparts. Again, it's the black Caribbean um, kids that see these high levels of exclusions. And then that, then you have to ask yourself, hang on a second, is this institutional racism blanket explanation adequate? Or is there other things going on that mean even if you're black, your outcomes are likely to be different. And this is why, unfortunately, the one size fits all explanation that white supremacy, systemic racism and racism are explanations that are sufficient enough to explain all racial disparities is just completely flawed and unhelpful. Because if you refuse to look at all the other potential explanations for why racial disparities exist, you will continue to make an incorrect diagnosis, which will lead you to continue to make insufficient solutions. And as a result, the people you claim to want to help will never be helped because you never actually care to look deeper into what's causing the racial disparity and therefore your solutions will never be adequate. Not only is this unhelpful, but all it does is create resentment and stoke racial tensions. It also causes us to completely fail racial groups. We can't even discuss why white working class students are underperforming or why they're not performing as well as other racial groups because acknowledging the fact that they are completely blows apart this ideology that systemic racism dictates everything in the UK and therefore if you have have white skin you are automatically advantaged literally no one benefits from this ideology white working class kids are let down and minority kids are made to feel like crap and feel demoralized because they are under the belief that they won't be able to accomplish the things that they want because there's a system designed to stop that from happening and this is a problem that people within the western world have because even if you look at america asians are the highest performing racial group in that country nigerian immigrants also outperform not only black americans but also white americans according to statistics from the U.S. Census Bureau. Several minority groups in America out earn white people. They earn more money than white people. These are the groups. Ready? Pakistani Americans, Lebanese Americans, South African Americans, Filipino Americans, Sri Lankan Americans, and Iranian Americans. And the number one group in the United States for earnings, India, Indians, they earn more money than anyone else. None of those groups, except for South Africa, are white-based. None of them. Second, black immigrant groups have a median household income above the American average. Who are black immigrant groups? Nigerians. Barbadans, Ghanaians, Trinidadans, all have higher incomes than the average American. And because whites are more than blacks and Hispanics, that's the factor. Third, Nigerian Americans 
are one of the most educated groups in America, according to a study by Rice University. They only make up 1% of African Americans, Nigerians, 1%. Yet, they are represented at the Harvard Business School at a rate of 25% of black students. So no wonder they are out earning whites, Nigerian Americans. I didn't know any of this, and I know you didn't know any of it. Now, those who love to use systemic racism as an explanation for all racial disparities will need to figure out how to make sense of that. You're going to have to explain why white people are not the highest performers in countries like the UK and the US, despite being the racial majority. You're going to have to explain why different black groups have different outcomes, despite all of them being black, because under your belief that systemic racism dictates all outcomes, why is it that some black groups end up becoming very highly successful and outperform even the white majority, whilst other black groups underperform? If it's systemic racism, then why does it not impact all black groups equally? Whoever's in charge of maintenance at systemic racism needs to be sacked because quite clearly they're sleeping on the job because there are a lot of ethnic minority people who seem to be completely bypassing this whole systemic racism thing and becoming very successful. So for us to have teachers teaching this false ideology to children in school is very, very toxic and it's very, very unhelpful. And I find this to be very, very infuriating because I've had a personal experience with this. When my sister was eight years old, we went to go pick her up from primary school and she came out of the classroom crying. So me and my stepdad were looking at each other like, what's going on here? So we asked her, you know, why are you crying? And she explained to us that basically she had had a lesson on racism and the teacher has said that because she's black, she's going to find it harder and she's going to struggle more than her white classmates. Now, this is the first time she's ever heard that before. So naturally, as an eight year old, it made her cry. And when I tell you I was fuming, I was livid. I wanted to have words with that teacher, but my stepdad wouldn't let me. He knew how it was gonna end. And so he was just like, just go sit in the car with her. I'll talk to the teacher. So I had to sit down with my sister in the car and try and repair the damage that was done to her self-esteem by these wokey dokey teachers. I had to explain to her why she can do whatever the hell she wants regardless of her skin color. There is no reason why my sister can't be whatever she wants to be. If she's good at it and she's willing to work hard for it, she can be whatever she wants to be. And I truly believe that. And why wouldn't I believe that? I literally witnessed my mother pull us out of severe poverty in the third world to a more comfortable life in the UK. I am an immigrant. I wasn't born in England. I'm not a Westerner. I was born into poverty in Zimbabwe, which is a third world country, as was my mother. And I feel very privileged to be the eldest child because I'm the only child out of all of my siblings who wasn't born in England. I'm the only child out of all of my siblings who got to see my mum's full journey from point A to where she is now. This is a woman who worked her way out of poverty in the third world. And let me tell you right now, poverty in the third world hits different. And my mother took us from that to a more comfortable life here in the UK. My mother is more successful than many Brits who were born and raised in this country, despite being a black woman. She should have had the double whammy of oppression because not only is she black, but she's also a woman. Yet despite that, she managed to be very successful and she managed to cultivate a very good life for herself here in the UK. And how did she accomplish that? She never made excuses. She never viewed herself as a victim, although she would have had every reason to because of the things that she experienced in her life. She's resilient, she's hardworking, and she's ambitious. She worked harder than most people are willing to work. And as a result, she got results that most people don't get. So if my mother can do that, then why the hell can't my sister when she had the advantage of being born in this country and therefore having to skip the extra steps that my mum had to go through. I think it's disgusting to teach young minority kids that they're going to inherently struggle because of their skin colour. To teach them that their skin colour is the most important thing about them and it dictates every single aspect of their life. Those of us who have the ability to simply open our eyes can see countless examples of successful black people and successful Asian people in the mainstream media, in entertainment, as well as the people who are outside of the spotlight. There are loads of black people who are successful successful doctors, lawyers, most of my friends are black and they are all doing very well for themselves and they're all very successful. And the reason why they're successful is mostly because they're African, to be honest. <laughs> and African people, we are born great. I'm ready for it. There's a reason why Africans tend to perform very highly in the UK as well as America. Africans are very, very like, 
when it comes to working hard and being successful. And a lot of parents from these backgrounds, as well as Asian parents as well, there's a lot of similarities between African parents and Asian parents in that they take a lot of pride. They take a lot of pride in their children performing well academically. And they take a lot of pride in their children performing well in terms of having careers that pay them well. And so for that reason, you're pushed from a very, very early age to be successful, which is why I think it's very, very limiting to push this idea onto children that their race is the most important thing about them and that their race is ultimately going to determine their outcomes. As if family structure, culture, values, and all these things don't play a massive role on your outcomes as a person. Yes, there are going to be some people who are going to be racist towards you, but those people do not dictate your outcomes. Those people do not dictate your future. Ultimately, your actions are the biggest impact on whether or not you have a successful, fulfilling life or not. And regardless of what color your skin is, you can be whatever the hell you want to be, provided you're actually good at it and you're willing to work hard for it. And many people have proven that to be true. If it wasn't true, we wouldn't have any successful black and Asian people. They wouldn't exist. I think it's really important for parents to know what their children are learning in school. I think it's important for you to have those kind of conversations with them and just ask them, you know, what did you learn in school today? What was in your lesson today? All that kind of stuff, because this is unacceptable. If I sent my child to school and they came home to me and told me that their teacher had essentially told them that their skin color is a handicap, I can't even imagine what I would do because I'd be furious. Parents do not send their kids to school for them to be taught that their skin color is a handicap. If you want to push this whole victim mindset and this whole victim mentality, which I've done a whole video on, if you want to know why it's not a good thing, if you want to push that, push that onto your own kids. Why have you got to push it onto ours? But that's it for this video. I had to just talk about it because I feel very, very passionately about this. Do let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on this. If you enjoyed this video, then you may as well like and subscribe. I am also on other socials if you'd like to check me out. Thank you very much for giving me your time today and I will see you in my next video.